Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now I had an idea that it would be good to do a video about Intel's naming scheme, how they name all their different processors. And I thought it would be an easy video. I thought, oh, it's easy. There's the i3 and the i5 and I'll just explain about it. But the more research I did, the more I discovered that Intel's naming scheme is actually crazy. It's just absolutely bizarre. So I've done lots of digging. I've tried to kind of formulate it all in my mind. So we're going to go on a journey and it's going to be a bit scary at times. But if you want to know about Intel's naming scheme, please let me explain. OK, first of all, in Intel's defense, they do make a lot of processors. And I guess it's kind of hard to really divide up the segments and the different use cases that these processors are designed for. So that's in their defense. But against them, I must say this, they've really done a terrible job at putting together a scheme by which a normal consumer can understand what kind of processor they are buying. So starting at the very top, Intel actually have eight different families of processors, eight brands of processors. Now, as I said, we're probably familiar with the core processors, that's the i3, the i5, and so on. But next to that, they've got two types of Xeon processors. They've also got an Atom processor family. There's still the Pentium family of processors. There's the Celeron family of processors. Then there's the Itanium, and there's also the Quark. Now, we won't have time today to go into all of those different families because that would be way too complicated. But just at the beginning, just to even start to form a picture in my mind, we start with eight different families that Intel are pushing out into the industry. So let's start with the Intel Core processors. Now, they have a long and potted history. I won't go over all the history now, but today where we're at is that we have a set of processors which are called the i3, the i5, and the i7. And they're the kind of three that you probably know and you may have seen adverts and you may have seen when you've read specifications for a PC. Oh, it's an i3, oh, it's an i5. And the general idea here is that the higher the number, the better the processor. So an i7 is meant to be better than an i5, an i5 is meant to be better than an i3, and so on. And of course, Intel recently introduced the i9 series, which is meant to be better than the i7. Then on top of that, you've got the extreme processors, and there are some i9 extreme processors, but there's also an i7 extreme and some an i5 extreme. And then down at the other end, you've also got the M3, which is meant to be some kind of uh, mobile processors. Now, when you look at the naming of each of these processors, the first digit in the uh, numbers after the i three dash, that first digit tells you the generation. So the current generation, uh, as I'm recording this video, is the eighth generation. So it'll be the i3 dash eight, and then some kind of number. And also after the generation number, the last three digits generally indicate the power of the processor. So the higher the number there, the better the processor. Now, of course, the big question is, what is the difference between the i3, the i5, and the i7? Well, here's a table that Intel have published that applies to their desktop processors. So as we can see here, the Intel Core i3s start with just four cores, and they don't support hyper-threading, and then they support DDR4 memory up to 2.4 gigahertz. Now, once you move over to the i5, here you can get up to six cores, and again, there's no hyper-threading, uh, and you get up to 2.6 uh, gigahertz memory. And then, of course, once you go up to the i7, now we get six cores and up to 12 threads, which means we've got support for uh, hyper-threading, and of course, you've got the same memory speeds as in the i5. So looking at that, what we're saying is i3 is the most basic, i5 you can have more cores, and i7 you can have more cores and you can have more threads. And if it was just that, that would be wonderful. It would be just so simple. Just like, hey, that's, that's fairly easy to understand. But the problem is that Intel also produce mobile versions. When I say mobile, I don't mean for smartphones. I mean for tablets and for laptops and for two-in-ones, that kind of thing. Their mobile version of these chips don't follow that pattern. You can get a hyper-threading version of the i5 for mobile, but you can't get a hyper-threading version of the i5 for the desktop. So when they move segment from desktop to mobile, then they actually change the rules by which they play. Now, on top of all this, Intel actually add a letter at the end of the model name that tells you something about the extra features or the segment that this particular chip is targeted for. So let's look at some of those letters. 
So probably the most popular one is K, and that's been around kind of since the second generation uh, uh, core processors, and that means it's unlocked. That means if you are into uh, overclocking, then you can use the K ones to kind of uh, fiddle with your motherboard and the process to try and eke out that extra power from your processor. So overclockers go for K. And then there's also the U letter they stick on the end, and that shows you that it's aimed at mobile, and that's why you can get an i5 that supports hyper-threading, but only when it's in the U variation, whereas a desktop version of the i5 doesn't support hyper-threading. You following? And then there's the H variant, which means it comes with high-performance graphics, and that's because 99% of Intel's uh, consumer processors come with a GPU built into the uh, chip and there is an Intel GPU and they put their better GPUs in the processors that have the H on them. And while we're talking about GPUs, Intel have actually signed a deal with their arch rival AMD to provide discrete graphics on the same piece of silicon with the Radeon Vega graphics cards. So they've now been added to the same piece of silicon. They're not part of the SOC, but they're part of the same piece of silicon with a very fast PCI connection between them. And so now you can actually get an I processor with two GPUs in it, one from Intel in the SOC part and one from AMD are kind of bolted onto the outside and they have a G letter at the end. And other ones worth mentioning for historical purposes are T for power optimized, HK for high performance graphics and unlocked at the same time, HQ for high performance graphics and a quad core. There was also the Y series, which is extremely low power, so even more lower than the U series, aimed again at tablets and that kind of thing. There was S for performance, M for mobile, and then various versions of the M, MQ, and MX for mobile extreme and mobile quad core and so on. Now, I did a whole video on three websites that will help you choose your next uh, uh, processor, and I'll link to that here, because when you're kind of focusing in on a particular processor, an i5, something or other, these sites will help you understand what you're getting for your money. Now, earlier on I mentioned hyper-threading. It's in some processors and not in others. There's another feature that's worth mentioning when you're doing research on a processor, and that is whether it supports Turbo Boost. And I'm going to do a whole separate video on Turbo Boost and how it works. But basically, it allows the CPU to up the frequency under certain circumstances, a boost, so that it can actually deliver high performance for a, for a certain peak workload. It's also worth looking at how much cache size the uh, processor has, and it's also worth looking at the memory speeds it supports. Now, I said it right at the beginning that the idea is that the i7 is better than an i5, and an i5 is better than an i3, and we generally assume that generation 8 processors will be better than generation 7 processors. But here I want to show you a graph from cpubenchmark.net that shows you the relative performance of different i processors, and we can see that actually it can be quite tricky to pick the right one. Now here at the top of the list we have the i7-8700T. T means it's power optimized, it runs at 2.4 gigahertz, but it has the highest score in our table here. Now this table is only a subset, there's a way, way more tables you can find over at cpubenchmark.net. But what I wanted to show you was that's an eighth generation processor. But the next one next to it in terms of performance is an i7-4. So that's a fourth generation one, and while it's running at a much higher clock speed, 3.4 gigahertz, it has almost the same performance. So from the fourth generation to the eighth generation, we're seeing here that the, uh, you can get the same kind of performance. So it's not necessarily true that the eight series is gonna be better. In fact, when you go down again, you also see here an i7 generation five, and of course that's the 820. Then here's what I wanted to show you. Below that, we've got the eighth generation i5, and actually you can see that it's outperforming four different i7s that are below it, including a third generation i7, two third generation i7s in fact, the 9600X and the 9700X. And then below that you have an eighth generation uh, 8750, which has got the H code on it, which of course means it's got high performance graphics. And then below that, you've also got a seventh generation one, which has got the X on it for extreme. So you can see here, there's an i5 eighth generation right smack in the middle of all these other generations of i7s. And then when you look at the very bottom of the list, you'll see here an i5 
eighth generation 500 running at three gigahertz, which has got a comparable uh, performance than all these other ones. So it can be tricky to know which ones you should be looking for. Now there is some logic to that, and that is that the best performance models from previous generations still beat the lower performing models from the new generations. But don't always assume that an i7 is gonna be better than an i5. It really does depend on the exact model number, the exact generation, it depends on the clock speed, and all the other things that you can find out about those processors. There's obviously a whole lot more that can be said about the uh, Intel Core processors. We haven't really touched on the i9s. Then there's the Extreme Editions as well. But for brevity's sake, let's quickly look at the Atom and the Pentium and the Celeron. Now, the Atom processors used to be found in netbooks and in laptops. You can even find them in some Android uh, smartphones. But nowadays, Intel seem to be repositioning them for network switches and for network attached storage. And then, of course, you've got the Pentium brand. Now, if you remember, there was way back when there was the 286 and the 386 and the 486, and Intel didn't release a 586 because it found out it couldn't copyright a series of numbers, so it turned to the Pentium, okay? And then you had the Pentium 2, which was really the 686, and so on. And that branding is still around today, and I suppose they're meant to be the kind of the low-end entry processors lower than what you get than the uh, than the i3 though when you look at the specifications you still get hyper threading for example in the pentium you can get two cores and four threads in the celeron it's just dual core no hyper threading but you kind of still get the same intel graphics that you get in some of the i3 and i5 processors so again there seems to be a lot of uh, overlap so really the key is you have to look at those websites that i listed in this video to really understand the features that you're getting and the performance you're getting for your money okay i'm going to draw it to a close here uh, there's just so much more to talk about. We, we haven't even touched on the Xeon processors and the Itanium and the Quarks and all that kind of stuff. But basically, Intel, please sort out your marketing. This is an absolute disaster. And it's so hard to know what you're getting when you buy a processor. Well, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please don't forget to subscribe. Please share this video on social media and please do tell me in the comments below what you think about Intel's marketing and their naming scheme. Does it make any sense to you? Okay, that's about it. I'll catch you in the next one.